welcome to that man talking. Come with me as we step into the deep, dark forest of fear. Let us pray we see sunrise in the morning. Come with me indeed, guys. Another fantastic and bone-chilling tale from the wonderful mind of Wayne Harbison. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Hunters Hunted, Lunum's Rest, Part 3, Hunter in the Night. Let's get straight into that. As far as Paul Lewis was concerned, life was good. He had just graduated from high school here in Carson City. He had his summer off before his first semester at Western Nevada Community College, where he had a free ride on a basketball scholarship. And he had his first paycheck from the summer job he'd taken at the Generalissimo Steakhouse. At six foot three inches and 235 pounds, with wavy black hair, blue eyes and a healthy tan, Paul cut a wide swath through the ladies who came through the restaurant. And he was big enough that even the rowdier male patrons tended to give him a wide berth. It seemed that once he had left high school, a whole new level of possibilities opened up to him among the ladies, and he was doing his level best not to disappoint as many as possible. Case in point was the pretty young lady named Gwen walking beside him right now. She was five foot seven, with blonde hair, deep blue eyes, in which on more than one occasion tonight he found himself getting lost. Her skin was like his grandmother's old bone china, and there was something compelling about her voice. She said little, but he found that when she did speak, he hung on every syllable. It was a short trip from the movie theatre to his blue 69 Cyclone Cobra jet the one with a 390. His dad had bought it for him on his 16th birthday, and the two of them had slowly restored it over the last few years. Thoughts of those days under the shade tree were far from his mind, as he showed her to the car and opened the door. Any special place you want to go? He asked, hoping she would say her place. He'd once read somewhere that a woman preferred her own bed. She smiled at him, and then looked up at the gibbous moon hanging in the sky. Her voice was sweet and compelling. Somewhere we can be alone. Why such a nice, clear night? I think maybe a moonlight swim would be perfect. And then, with a shadowy grace, she slid into the seat. He quickly trotted around to the front of the car to the other side and got in. I didn't wear my swim trunks he said carefully, hoping she got the hint. I always swim in the nude, she told him. Grinning, he replied. I know a place where we can swim alone. It's a bit of a drive, and then we have to hike about a mile or so up a trail to the lake. But it's isolated. I knew you'd know a place, she told him, stroking his face gently. Her touch was cool in the warm night air, but it sent tongues of flame shooting through his body. He was glad for the two little foyer packets in his wallet. He might be the all-American male athlete, but he wasn't stupid. He had plans for his life, and it didn't include a family just yet. He pulled out onto the late night traffic of Carson City and headed east towards 580. Hidden the interstate, he drove them south, then west and got off of the highway at Highway 50 and followed it to 28. Once he hit the winding road that snaked around Lake Tahoe, on their left, he opened up the cyclone's engine and poured on the speed. Next to him, Gwen seemed to shimmer in the cool moonlight, and his thoughts wandered to speculation about what was under that pale green, ruffled shirt that she was wearing. He smiled when she reached over and gently ran her fingernails down his right arm, from his bicep to his wrist. And suddenly the car's cabin seemed too warm, when he found the front of his jeans more than a little confining. He smiled at the thoughts of what he knew was to come as it flashed across his mind. 
as she repeated the motion, and he wondered how sensitive his skin had suddenly become. As she reached his wrist, she dropped her hand to his lap for several seconds before removing it with a smile. Paul had to remind himself to breathe, and this was one intense chick. He glanced down at the speedometer and realized the car had crept up to nearly 80. As they rounded a curve that cut away from the lake, she repeated the action. This time, when her hand reached his wrist, it suddenly darted to the steering wheel and yanked it hard to the right. In a surprise, Paul hit the brake with everything he had as the car skidded to the side and into a gravel of the shoulder before turning around nearly 180 degrees and then slamming into a large pine tree. Next to him, Gwen faded into the mist as Paul's body was slung through the open car window and sideways across another tree about ten yards down the road. He felt the bones between his shoulder blades snap and had felt nothing below that. He tried to raise his hands to turn himself over, but his arms had no strength. He could barely feel them, but somehow he managed to roll over as Gwen's face suddenly floated into his field of vision. Why? He asked softly and painfully. Shh. She gently touched her fingers to his lips. Because you taste better this way. What? He asked, confused. She bent down to kiss him, but at the last moment her head ducked to the nape of his neck. He felt a sudden pain where her fangs had slid into his veins but couldn't muster the strength to push her away. As the soft sucking sounds began to fill the night air, he found that he no longer wanted to. Deep in the moonlight night, Paul Lewis's basketball scholarship came open to another player. It was late afternoon and Sheriff Jacob Webb resisted the urge to throw the file sent over from Carson City Sheriff's Office against the wall. He was convinced that the spirits of his grandfathers were testing him this summer. First with the animal attack on Bartholomew Boyd's ranch. Now the bodies were piling up on both here and over in Carson City. The feds huh, had stepped in and taken a body or whatever it was that they had killed out of the ranch and insisted it was a bear attack. Well, Jack was fine with that. He'd rather not deal with the crazies that would come out if people said it was a Bigfoot. But now... There were several nasty accidents that just didn't make sense. People were dying in common every day, if not bizarre accidents. But the autopsy results all said the same thing. Death by exanguation. And strangely enough, all of them had broken necks on top of the loss of blood. 35 people had died in accidents around Washoe County and Carson City in the past 15 days. Of those 15 were death by exanguation, one per day. The Lewis boy last night was a prime example. There was no reason for him to have lost control of that car, and there was not enough blood at the scene to account for the lack of it in his body. The more he thought about it, the more it was started to sound like those murders in Vegas about 10 years ago. A lot of dead women, and the sheriff looking like a fool as his deputies getting tossed around like toys. Luckily, Jake didn't have a crazy reporter here telling people to watch out for vampires, or driving a stake through the heart of the primary suspect. And then some crazy writer got a hold of the story, and they made a movie about it. He studied the numbers again. And technically, it only became his job to investigate when there was a foul play involved. But when the coroner had brought the numbers to him yesterday, he knew a pattern was forming. A pattern that scared him. These things aren't supposed to exist. They're fanciful tales told by bored writers. But again, neither was that thing that his brother and company killed out at Lunum's Rest two weeks ago. But it did. He'd seen it himself, and he damn well knew that was no bear. Chief, Sergeant Martin asked from his door. I hate to disturb you. No, no, no. Right now, disturbing me is a favor. What is it? Uh, you said to let you know if anything strange or unusual came in. Yeah, Jake asked with a sinking feeling. Well, 
Matoska and man too fancy to call about a bad smell coming from a house trailer at the edge of Incline Village. Oh, do I want to know? Jake asked. Five bodies, boss. Oh, with broken necks and their throats ripped out. Jake shook his head and looked up at the ceiling. The grandfathers were testing him. Martin continued. Uh, there's more. Oh, go ahead. Three of the bodies were children, sir. Damn, Jake said, rising from his desk. He hated it when kids were hurt. They had twisted a knot in his belly that wouldn't go away until it ate a new hole in his gut. Oh, who'd you put on it? Rust is full, Martin said. Everybody's working more than one case. I'll take it, Jake said. You? Martin asked. With all due respect, sir, the last time you took a case, you tossed a city alderman through a plate glass window. <laughs> Jake said, his voice dripping in sarcasm. Give me the file, he said. With a look of trepidation, Martin handed him the manila envelope and scurried back to his desk. Uh, yes, sir. Jake looked at the address on the file and realised that it was less than two miles as the crow flies east of Lunam's Rest. Just more evidence that the grandfathers had tested me, he thought to himself. How does that old Chinese curse go? May you live in interesting times? Well, this qualifies. He looked out the door and asked, Are they still on the scene? No, sir, the sergeant replied. Man tooth caught it in while the coroner's men were looking for the bodies. I will tell Mantooth and Mantuska to leave their case notes with you and I'll look at them when I get back. He looked over to the board where the assignments were listed and noted that they were working the case of the construction worker who fell off the scaffold in, in the middle of the night and broke its neck. Another case with a body whose cause of death was exanguation. It was becoming so prevalent that his detectives had actually learned to spell the word. I will do. He picked up his hat and gun and said, I got my radio. I'm going to check with some of the neighbours. Martin nodded and said, Understood, sir. And that, of course, was Martin speak for, I know you're going to check on your brother and his lover. It wasn't quite an open secret, but a few of the men at the department knew about Jason Webb and Bartholomew Boyd and were discreet with the information. Thanks, Martin. Jake said as he headed out to the blazer that served as the sheriff's car. He wanted to get more information from Jay and Bart, and maybe the McKnight kid. It had been a long couple of days of learning the various chores that went into keeping a working ranch operational. Lars was convinced that over the last two weeks he'd dug enough irrigation ditches and laid enough pipe to drain Lake Tahoe. And Bart had been right. There was a lot to do on a ranch, but you had to know how to do it right to do anyone any good. He'd also been given responsibility for making sure the goats, hogs and chickens were fed. He had to admit that he enjoyed the work, even if it was hard. It gave him something to get lost in and forget about the world around him. This was fixing things he could fix and doing it the right way, and he was working with his hands, which was something he always enjoyed. His favourite responsibility, however, was to every two hours ride up and check on the cattle that were commonly grazing in the pasture, but had seen the gugwe that first day. And with the creature dead and the spring thaw finally over, he found that he could enjoy the solitude of the ride. He could learn to like living like this. As the sun was going down in the west, he was currying little Joe after the day's ride, and the horse was nearly preening under the care. I think you might just be a little bit vain, boy, he told the Polomino. The horse just shuddered in pleasure under the touch. Lance saw the shadows of someone entering the barn behind him. Remembering what Kinan had told him, he shifted the olfactory bulb behind the roof of his mouth to a specific configuration. And then opening his mouth, he breathed in and felt an explosion of scents around him. It was a technique that cats use called the Fleming response, and it helped them analyze smells more easily, 
behind the scent of the feed, hay, animals and of course the manure. He caught two scents he recognised right away. It took him a few seconds to identify the third scent, the smell of Sheriff, Webb. Without looking up from the horse's rithers, he said, Evening, Uncle Bart, Jay, Sheriff Webb. How did you know it was us? Jay asked. Standing, he patted little Joe's withers and then hung up on the brush before turning around to see the three men. I told you that I'm always aware of my surroundings. He closed his mouth and returned it to its normal configuration and then yawned deeply. Oh, I'm sorry. Lance noted a concerned look on all three men's faces. No problem, Bart said. Cobb tells me you're more than pulling your weight around here. He tells me that you took over the chores he gave you and you make sure they're not only done, but done right. I appreciate that. Lance chuckled and said, <laughs> I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't enjoying myself. It's good not to have anything to worry about except for some ditches, a few goats, hogs and chickens, and a small herd of cattle. Next to him, Sheriff Webb said, well, That's a lot of responsibility for a kid. What you mean is that's a lot of responsibility for a city kid? Lance said. I'm sure there's kids my age who do this thing all the time on their family's farms. Uh, fair point, Sheriff Webb said. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Lance looked over to his uncle and his partner, and then back to Webb. And with a smile, he held up his hands and said, I didn't do it. You can't prove it. You'll never find the body. And for just a second, all three men looked at each other in surprise before they realized he was joking. Recognizing what that meant, he sighed and tried to hide the resignation in his voice. Well, it was fun while it lasted. What's happened? Again, the three adults exchanged questioning looks. What makes you think something has happened? Sheriff Webb asked. Because you're wanting to ask a 14-year-old some questions? I know I haven't done anything to warrant a questioning, so you're looking for some information you think I might have because of my past involvement with things like what happened here a few weeks ago? Hmph. <laughs> Sometimes, you're too smart for your own good. You know that kid? Webb said. I'm sorry, Lance replied. Now what's happened? What do you know about vampires? Webb asked. You mean besides what we see in the movies and on television? You mean real, honest-to-goodness vampires? Vampires are real? Jay asked. It depends. A good way real? Jake's right. Sometimes you are smart for your own good. At least Jay was smiling when he said it. Whatever you might know, it could be useful. You still haven't told me what has happened, Lance pressed. Okay, a family of five found in a house trailer about two miles from here. Coroner says they've been dead for about two weeks. All of them had broken necks, their throats ripped out and died from a loss of blood. Sheriff Webb then said. There have been others too, all of them with broken necks and dead from a loss of blood, but made to look like accidents. Okay, that helps me help you. If there's a vampire out there, and I'm not saying that there is, what are you blabbering about, kid? Webb asked. We all know that you know more about these things than you're letting on. Why are you being difficult? Because I don't want to end up with a new dinner jacket. You know, the white ones with arms that they tie in the back? Sheriff Webb stopped and gave him a surprised look. And finally, he just said, Hmm, understood. Lance replied, Now, from what I've studied, you're dealing with one of two types of vampire, both of which live on blood, preferably human. The first is what they call a brother race to mankind. They aren't undead, but they're very long-lived. They reproduce normally and can't infect someone. Now, since the necks are broken, I tend to think it's not one of them. The vampiri don't have to kill their victims when they feed, and they don't have to worry about them rising from the grave later. Okay, Webb said. From what little information you've given me, it sounds like a typical undead kind of vampire. Because he's breaking necks? Webb asked. Do you have some evidence that it's a man? Webb seemed to think about what Lance had just asked. 
Hmm. Now that you mention it, no. I guess I'm just assuming it's a man because he's breaking their necks. And that takes an awful lot of strength. Well, vampires are preternaturally strong. I think Stoker described them as having the strength of 20 men. If he's right, a healthy female vampire will be able to lift and avenge about half a ton, lowballing their normal lifting power to be 50 pounds. A male will be on the average be able to lift a ton. Either one of those is more than capable of snapping a grown man's neck. Webb looked over at Jay in surprise. Okay, what else can you tell me? Lance sighed and said, There are a variety of abilities they can acquire over time. The ability to shapeshift, to go on two-dimensional or into a mist, to summon wolves, bats, rats, and other nocturnal creatures, to name just a few. The vampire I fought could splinch itself between spaces, halving the distance to its target each time it did so. She could also stretch her limbs like a rubber band. She was strong and fast. The one you fought? Webb demanded. Lance nodded and said, Yeah, she was a special case, cursed to be what she was by something far more evil and powerful than her. What about weaknesses? Webb asked. I mean, can you hold him off with a cross? Or kill him with a stake through the heart? That kind of thing. Do they have to ask permission to enter a house? A stake through the heart will just about kill anything, Sheriff, Lance told him. I never try to use a cross. I think that takes a faith and that I don't have. As for asking permission to enter a house, I'm not sure. It would make it easier to keep them out. The one thing I can tell you that's effective for putting one down and keeping it down is to cut off its head. Best then to burn the body and head separately when you do. I know you can put one down temporarily by blowing out their brains, but that's only going to slow it down for a few moments, just long enough for it to put itself back together. When you dropped it, you need to cut off its head while you have the chance. And that's what Dad and I did. He shot it in the head and blew out the back of its skull. And while it was trying to heal, I took an axe to it and chopped off its head. Kendall saw this thing? Bart asked. Lance nodded and said, Yeah, he entered a high-powered rifle into it. It didn't go down until he got its head shot that blew out its brain case. Lucian Dow saw it too. I'm not sure what you guys are talking about, Webb said. Uh, just my crazy mixed-up life where I seem to be drawn to these things, Lance told him. Now, the question is, what are you going to do with the information, Sheriff? I mean, you can't issue your deputies a stake and a hammer, and if not, get reported on, making you look like you've taken leave of your senses. Boy, you make too much sense for a kid, Webb said. Lance just shrugged. It was one of the problems of being a 50-plus-year-old man in his soon-to-be 15-year-old body. Be that as it may, the question is still out there. What do you do with the information? Well, since you're so full of good insight, what would you suggest? Webb asked. Lance shrugged and said, oh, Pick a couple of deputies you know and trust, and who can be trusted with this knowledge. Give them some training and background information and send them out to deal with it. Make it a special task force. Hmm. Huh. Not a bad idea, Webb said as he obviously considered the matter. Well, I do have a few deputies I can trust with something like that. He then turned back to Jake and Bard and asked, So, what are your plans for Saturday night? I haven't given it much of a thought. We've just been trying to catch up from having to move the herds. What than we planned? He nodded back to Lance and asked, Have you had a chance to take him into Carson City? On Saturday night? Not really, but it's really something we should do, now that you mention it. Otherwise, he's going to get the wrong idea about being a ranch hand. What do you think, Lance? His uncle asked him. Want to go into town tomorrow night? To do what? Lance asked, careful to keep his voice neutral towards the idea. Well, to get something to eat, maybe see a movie, or listen to some music. He stopped for a second to think and then asked, And just how good are you on that guitar? Lance shrugged. 
probably on par with my dad. I still make a few mistakes and have to play a song several times before I know it. If I recall, Kendo was pretty good with one. He's been teaching a friend of mine and me how to play it. Let me guess, most of it's a couple of decades old? Bart teased. Lance just nodded and said, mm, Most of it. But my friend Ted taught him to play Freebird. Well, the Generalissimo has an open mic night on Friday nights. We could go into town this evening, get something to eat and then let you try your hand at it. You said that place was mostly college kids on the weekends, Lance said. And somehow, I don't see them appreciating any old George Jones or Marty Robbins songs, much less Hank Williams and Johnny Horton. You might be surprised, Jay said. Heard a decent version of Comanche a few months ago there. He smiled and his voice dropped into a teasing mode. Who knows, you may even meet a nice girl to keep you company. Lance just smiled and kept his thoughts about that kind of thing to himself. Yeah, he was an older man, but sometimes his body reminded him that he was still in these throes of puberty. His mind might be in his fifties, but his body was definitely still a teenager. Sign, he asked. <sighs> okay, what time do you want to leave? I'm looking at his wristwatch, Bart said. Well, it's half past five now. Say we leave here a quarter after? Lance got the feeling his uncle simply wanted to eat it. To Generalissimo. Because Yvonne had already warned him that it was Bart's favourite place to get a steak, a beer, and an occasional fight with the college kids. He was definitely a boyd, that was for sure. Can you have your chores finished by then? My chores are finished. I just got back from checking on the herd in the northwest pasture for the last time today. And Cobb said he would check on them tonight when he goes out to check on the northeast herd. And that there was no use in both of us going out tonight. I was supposed to take his herd on Sunday night. He didn't rope you into a Saturday night? Jake asked. I may be young, but I wasn't born yesterday, Lance told him. And Webb laughed and said, That boy is going to be a handful. He then turned on his hill and headed back towards the front of the house. I better get going. Charlene is going to be wondering what happened to me. She's making something special for dinner tonight. What is it? Jay asked as the two men walked away. Bart, however, stayed. When he was sure the other two were out of earshot, he asked, Now, how are you settling in here? I mean, how are you handling being so far from home? Lance smiled over at him and said, I'm good. I'm actually enjoying part of it. Not the good way attack part, but... Being out in the sun, working with my hands and riding up to check on the herd. I like that part. He stopped for a moment and then added, uh, To be honest, I wouldn't know what to do if there was something the matter with them. Or even if I would recognise it. But I enjoy the ride up. Bart nodded and said, Hmm, I understand. And there's not likely to be anything wrong with a herd that you would recognise or could do anything about. Mainly, you need to make sure the defences are in place, and that all the cattle were tagged, and, and that there aren't any losses. He sighed and added, I'm just sorry that your first few days here were what they were, and now that Jake had to ask you about that other stuff. I was hoping to put it all behind us. Lance chuckled softly and said, <laughs> It's okay. I'm sort of getting a feel for the rhythm of these kind of things. I'm starting to recognise when they start to build. I'm getting the feeling that when one of these events is over, that there's a reset period. I'm learning to enjoy the lows and to be wary of the highs. Hmm. Do you really want to go out tonight to the Generalissimo? Lance laughed and said, Actually, yeah. I'm not so keen about this open mic thing, but I'll give it a try. Usually, the only time I play is alone, when I'm practicing. Most of the time, it's either with Dad or Ted with the whole gathering at his pickings. He still has those? Bart asked. Well, of course he still does. Otherwise you wouldn't have mentioned it. I mean, I'm surprised that he hasn't grown tired of them. Not a chance. He sees it as time to spend with a family and friends. Dad may be tough around the edges, but he at least knows what's important and works to keep it that way. Is he happy with Lucy? I think so. Mum and Roy seem to be good fit, 
It's taken me a while to realise that. Their fights were upsetting my own balance. I'm not having to learn to let them deal with each other their own way, and not let it bleed over into my own relationships with them. Is that why you agreed to come out here and visit this summer? Lance nodded. Something like that. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm glad I came. I'd hate to think about what would have happened to you and Jay. Uh, maybe Yvonne, had I not come out. But I also appreciate the time away from shutting back and forth between Mum and Dad. And that you and Jay are willing to put up with me. Huh, <laughs> no problem there, kiddo. You've been a whole lot easier to deal with than Jay's cousins who occasionally visit from Duckwater. He leaned in and whispered, But don't tell him I said that. They're good kids, but one or two of them have more than a little lazy streak to them. I wouldn't know, Lance said. If there's one thing I never want to be called, it's lazy. <laughs> no danger in that, Bart said. Uh, speaking of Jay. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought about him. You mean about him or about the both of you? <laughs> that too. Lance took a deep breath and said, I think he's a good and caring man. I think something happened to him when he was a kid and he really doesn't want to talk about it or when he wants to know about it, but, but he's good people. As for the both of you, I'm happy for you. There's way too much pain in the world to deny anybody whatever happiness they may find. You're awful calm about the idea. Lance just shrugged, smiled and said, I guess I'm just ahead of my time. You two don't throw it in people's faces. You're discreet, which is something I can appreciate. I wish the world wasn't in such a way that you had to be, but maybe in a few decades that'll change. And what about that word Jay didn't want to talk about? Skinwalker? Yeah. What is it? I tried asking him about it and he got very ornery about not answering. Well, I don't know what he went through, but I can tell you what I know about them in general. I just threw out a word because I wasn't sure if he would know. Skinwalker is actually a Navajo legend and they're very tight-lipped about it. I've been told they react to the word the same way Jay did. But what are they? A medicine man or a sorcerer who's gone bad. They gain their darker powers from kin killing. They're shapeshifters who take the forms of the animals and even people they kill by wearing their skins. They usually make burial grounds their lair. They're very evil and to see one is usually a death sentence. And Jay is Shoshan. Where would he hear it from? Lance shook his head and said, I don't know. There might be some mixing of different tribes in the reservations. I'm really not privy to that kind of information. Well, how did you find out about them? Uh, you know me. My favourite singer is Johnny Horton. I go digging for history and mythology wherever I can find it. There's an old man who sometimes would tell me stories about these kind of things. If I ask him just right. Lance didn't tell his uncle that that old man was over a thousand years old and he believed him to be the Vasir of Norse legend. Well, when you finish up here, go get a shower, and the three of us will head on into town. If you wanna, bring your guitar. Lance nodded and smiled. He put away his gear, swept out little Joe's stool, and gave him some fresh feed and hay, and then headed up to the house. He hadn't seen much of Carson City since he got here. He had been through it when he arrived on the bus, and then back again when he and Bart had gone into town to buy the rifle. And this would be his first chance to see it in a more normal setting. Bart was as good as his word. And the three of them pulled out into the front of the huge ranch house at a quarter past six. It took about half an hour to get to the diner, and this time the parking lot was nearly full when they pulled in. As people moved in and out of the front door, Lance could hear the strains of someone doing a passable job at Kenny Rogers' daytime friends, nighttime lovers. Think you can top that? Jay asked him with a smile. Is it a competition? Lance asked. Boy, you've got an annoying habit of answering a question with a question. Anybody ever told you that? Jay asked with a broad smile. Ignoring the jab, Lance replied, I don't know. I haven't had any formal training. I just sing on my dad's pick at the guitar. But I'll give it a try. He reached into the back of the jeep and pulled out the case with his guitar. 
The ambience of the restaurant had completely changed from the last time he'd been there. That time it felt like a diner, an out-of-the-way place where people in the know could go and get a good meal with a friendly service for a good price. Now, it was nearly packed with customers sitting at their tables, eating dinner, and listening to various locals get up and sing, or, based on the current guy looking for notes to Dave and Sugars, the door is always open, and try to sing. Much to Lance's surprise, Loretta met them at the door, still dressed in military surplus olive drab. Evening, folks, she said with a smile. Then, looking down at a guitar case in Lance's hand, she asked, I take you want a chance to sing tonight? Yes, ma'am, Lance replied. Well, we got an open slot in about half an hour. That'll probably be about the time you get your meals. I can ask the kitchen to hold them until after you sang. Well, that would be nice, ma'am. Lance told her. Sometimes it's not a good idea to sing right after eating. Uh, what you gonna sing? She asked, picking up a notebook from the greeter's station. I thought I'd do Marty Robbins, Big Iron. And your name is? Lance McKnight, ma'am. Finishing her entry with a tap at a pencil, she said. Got it. Can't wait to hear you. As she finished, the singer on the stage overshot the notes he was looking for, and the PA system squealed in protest. And then with a slight grimace, she added, I really can't wait to hear you. Your uncles tell me you're pretty good. Thank you, ma'am, Lance replied. Now, follow me. I've got Bart's usual place cleared. Your usual place? Lance asked. Where we sat last time. It's away from most of the other tables. What's he not telling you? Jay broke in to say. Is that one of his favorite pastimes is picking fights with college kids? Loretta had to pull him away from them permanently. I just got no use for people who spit on me when I come home from defending the country. The big man grumbled. I know what you mean, Lance said. When Uncle Larry came home from Nam, I went with Paw Paw to pick him up at the airport. I'll never forget we were waiting for him on the concourse when he decked. The hippie who told the soldier in a wheelchair next to him that he deserved what he got. Lance shook his head and added, Funny that cop standing right next to us didn't see a thing. He looked up at Bart and said, I can understand you feeling that way. How's Larry doing? Rather well. He settled down in Gulf City with his new wife and stepdaughter. His wife is expecting twins in the fall. Larry settled down? Never thought I'd hear that. Married life seems to agree with him. Haha, <laughs> glad to hear it. The three then took their seats at the table, and Loretta got their drink order and disappeared into the crowd. As they settled in, Jay asked, Well, how do you like your ranch life so far, Lance? Lance shrugged. Not counting the good way part, I actually like it. Like I told Uncle Bart, I like working with my hands and... I like the solitude when I'm riding a herd. Uh, most boys your age don't want to be out in the country, Jay said. Especially city boys. Lance shook his head and said, I don't know where you got your idea I'm a city boy. I live on a 2,500 acre plantation just south of Gulf City. I grew up in Coleman County on an 80 acre farm until Mum moved us to Mobile when she and Dad split. I'm sorry, Jay said. I just hear Gulf City and think Big City. Unlike Carson City? Lance asked. It's actually the state capital. Well, looks like somebody thinks you clean up pretty good, Bart said quietly, changing the subject. Huh? Lance asked. That little blonde two tables over. She keeps staring at you. I've seen that look in a girl's eyes before. Lance looked over to where there was a pretty blonde girl, about his age, dressed in jeans and a western-style shirt, who was eating dinner with her family. She glanced over and caught Lance looking, and suddenly blushed and looked down at her food. Lance just chuckled and looked back at Jay and Bart. <laughs> she's pretty. It's the hair, Jay said, teasing him. Girls like long hair on a guy. My hair isn't that long, Lance protested. It's shoulder length. That's not long. I've seen guys with hair down to their waist. And then with a smile he said, But you got a point. Ho oh, ho, Jay asked in surprise. You ever wonder why teenage girls go for singers like Leif Garrett or Sean Cassidy? You're going to say long hair? In part, Lance said. 
They aren't rough around the edges, they aren't all that masculine, and they're perceived as much less of a threat. They're safe to fall for because they remind them of other girls. What they don't realise is that those guys are just as much of a threat as the harder looking ones. They aren't nearly as dangerous as the other girls are. And Jay gave him a surprised look and said, You're awful young to be a cynic. Lance laughed and added, I'm far more dangerous than either of those rough looking boys or the other girls. Just how many notches on the bedpost? Lance blushed and said, None. That's just by my choice. I've had more than a few offers, he smiled and said. From both sides of the fence. That shocked both men. And what are you waiting for? Bart asked. I told you. I had plans for myself, Lance told him. Those plans don't include with being with someone right now. I've got too much to do and be distracted by a pretty face. Boy, when you fall, you're going to fall hard, Bart said. It ain't natural for a boy your age not to have an interest in them kinds of things. I didn't say I didn't have an interest. Trust me, I've had some interest in offers, but I've had a few lines I won't cross. Such as? I won't mess with what belongs to someone else, for one. He sighed and added, I'm a quarterback on a state champion football team. You have to know I've had offers, but most of it's been either someone wanting to be a notch on their bedpost, or would turn into a mess or a drama. And that's something I can do without. Like I said, I've had this need to fix things, and a relationship will play hell with that right now. Then he smiled and added, And do you have any idea how much the ups the ante? Girls have something to prove as much as boys. The more I turn them down, the more they come back looking for more. Hmm. Be careful with that, Bart said. People may get the other idea about you. Lance shrugged and said, And I should care? Why? If someone gets in my face calling me those names, then they have to explain why they got their ass kicked by a... Lance stopped talking when he saw Loretta approaching the table. You're up next, Lance, she said. Just take your guitar over to the edge of the stage and get ready. Yes, ma'am, he told her and got up from the table. Be back in a few. When the next singer was finished, the MC announced... And now Lance McKnight will sing an old Marty Robbins favourite. Taking the small platform of the stage, he caught a flash of a blonde in the crowd. It was difficult to see him past the lights, but he could suddenly feel a very unfriendly gaze on him. For a moment, he was nearly paralysed by its intensity. It took him a second or two to shake off the feeling and settle down into the chair. And soon, he was strumming out the first few chords and began... To the town of Aguifria rode a stranger one fine day. He became lost in the story of the song, doing his best to draw a picture of the setting with his voice and his music. And finally, he finished up with, And the notches on his pistol numbered one to nineteen more, one and nineteen more, one nineteen more. By the time he was finished, he realised the restaurant had become quiet, and nearly everyone in the room was watching him. Even the servers had stopped to listen to the story of the Arizona Ranger and the Texas Red. And suddenly, the spell was broken, and the room erupted into applause. Lance nodded, and got up from his seat and said, Thank you, thank you. He then headed towards the table with his uncle. He was keenly aware of several eyes following him across the room. The first was a woman in her early twenties, dressed in a pale green ruffled shirt and skirt. The other was the girl that Bart had pointed out to him. He could sense the predator in both their gazes. And grateful for the opportunity to sit down at the diners, to return to their meals, and he sighed deeply. I didn't know you could play and sing like that, Bart said. I mean, I've heard you practicing in your room, but never anything like that. It was like I could see the whole scene in my head. Yeah, you were good up there, Jay said. Real good. You think so? Ted and I have joked about starting a garage band, but our musical tastes are so different that the only thing we can agree on is southern rock. And there are only so many songs in that genre to cover. He shrugged and added, But, to be honest, that's the first time people have reacted that way when I sing. Lance, there's something to look into. You got some raw talent. 
Voice lessons could take you a long way. I've got too many irons in the fire now. I mean, it's fun, but it won't help me get into Anopolis. Hmm, the plans you mentioned? Bart asked. Lance nodded and said, Yeah. Well, you might be surprised what they might find valuable on a cadet's resume. Have you ever heard of the Navy Choir? Lance nodded. Yeah. Well, something to think about, Jade told him as Loretta arrived with their food. Well, you told me he was pretty good, but not that good, Loretta said, sitting the plate down in front of Bart. I didn't know it myself, Bart replied. I've only ever heard him sing through his bedroom door. He hasn't considered that the rest of us might enjoy his picking and singing. Okay, okay, Lance said. I get the hint. Hint? Boy, we ain't hinting about nothing. You need to start practicing on the front porch where we can all hear you. Who knows? Maybe we can get Carp to join you on his fiddle. I like playing with a fiddle player, Lance said with a smile. They can take the music so much farther than I can with just my guitar. See? Loretta said. I just want to see you here next week. Lance shrugged and said, It depends on what we need to do on the ranch. I think we're supposed to go out on a range sometime soon. I'm sure we can make sure we're back here by Friday night, Bart told him. Gwendolyn nearly twisted her own head off when she heard the name McKnight announced. Turning her gaze on that boy, taking the stage, she studied him closely. And there was definitely a family resemblance to Marshall McKnight. The eyes were the same blue. They both moved with the same easy cat-like grace. They could be related, but probably several generations removed. And she was still trying to figure out this strange new world in which she found herself. When he started singing, she was caught up in the imaginary of the song about a gunfight in New Mexico. The boy could somehow project his witcheries into the song and enrapture the audience. And that told her that he had to be of a fear McKnight's blood somehow, and that made him her enemy. If she couldn't have her vengeance on Marshall, she'd have it on his family. She watched as he sat down with two men at the table in the corner. She recognized them as the men at whom she had aimed the huge beast a few weeks ago. She was surprised that they had survived, or perhaps even triumphed. But then again, they had that boy with them, and he may have made the difference. She would have to quietly probe their defenses, see how vulnerable they were. And she just had the idea of how to do that. It would take about a week to set up everything. And she overheard the waitress demand that a boy would be back next Friday. That was all she needed, and she would have her revenge on the descendant of her jailer. She smiled to herself, thinking, My next few meals are let rise. Wow, 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 and another one, wow. Absolutely, each and every time, Wayne, your stories just seem to capture my imagination. Um, what an intense and just an absolute spellbinding story there. Wonderful, wonderful writing. Guys and girls, please do, as ever, let us know what you thought down below in the comments. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And of course, why not hashtag Team Fear. Of course, if you guys have enjoyed this series and the other series I've covered from Wayne's wonderful, wonderful mind, don't forget you can actually get yourself a copy of the, uh, the stories in book format from Amazon Books, of which I'll leave the links to those in the description box below. Uh, Wayne has quite a plethora of stories back cataloging from years and years ago, slowly making our way through them. Um, and this has to be one of my favorites on the channel from the whole time I've been doing this. The Hunters Hunted, what a fantastic storyline. I look forward to much, much more, Wayne. And I hope you guys do as well. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>